Um, and if you would like to share your screen whenever you'd okay. like, um, and I'll go ahead and go ahead and do that. So just welcome everybody to tonight's uh, virtual Riverside chat with Neil Bergenroth. Um, he's going to be speaking with us about understanding force curves to improve, and he's uh, calling in from Tulsa, Oklahoma. Um, before I get to his introduction, just a bit about upcoming chats. Uh, for some changes to the schedule, first off, uh, we've, we have rescheduled J uh, Greg Saborin, the North Bay Rowing Club member and founders um, talk that was originally scheduled for Tuesday, November 24th. Um, it's going to be on the topic of history and efforts to build a community boathouse. And this talk is being rescheduled to uh, happen in early spring of 2021. And I'll keep you posted about that. Um, on Tuesday, December 8th at 5 p.m., we'll have U.S. National Team Coxswain Colette Lucas Conwell. She's going to join us. And following her the, the following week on Wednesday, December 16th, we'll have U.S. National Team Kendall Chase. And with both of these guests, I'm still crafting their topics with them. So if you've got some questions that you've always wanted to ask an Olympian in training, um, please do email me and I'll put my email in the chat. Um, so that'll be fun. And then on Wednesday, January 6th at 5 p.m., Felix Mulbach, our most recent chat guest. Um, and just an aside, a plug for him, if you weren't at the session last week and you're a master's, I recommend watching that video. It, it's, it's got a lot of really great information in it. But anyways, Felix has uh, generously arranged and will co-host a panel discussion on January 6th on rhythm from the perspective of our, of our guest, Andrew Randall, rowing Australia coach, Connie Draper, internationally known applied sports biomechanist, and Olivia Coffey, professional athlete and gold medalist. So that's going to be really cool. And then other confirmed but yet to be rescheduled chats will be with Friends of the Petaluma River, Executive Director Stephanie Bastianen, and uh, sports psychologist and professor Glenn Brassington, um, and SSU professor Nicole Myers on, and she's going to focus on the geological origins and evolution of the Petaluma watershed. So those are just a few things coming up this spring. Um, feel free to contact me for more details and any suggestions that you have for possible topics or speakers for this venue. Um, yeah, I'm willing to explore it all. Uh, and then if you haven't already, I put a bunch of information in the chat. Um, so if you can take a moment to just type in where your affiliation and your location. I just think it's cool for folks that are on uh, live tonight to just see where everybody's calling in from. And then uh, during our time with Neil tonight, just um, if you have any questions, just go ahead and put those questions in the chat and we'll refer to them during the Q&A following this talk. And, you know, if the group says, stays pretty small, we'll just open it up and people can just, you know, unmute and ask questions and what have you. So, um, but that's that. So getting into the introduction, I'm, I'm going to try to make this introduction respectfully brief because um, our, our guest, Coach Neil Bergenroth, has had a lot of good water, so to speak, under his boat. And I'd like us to all have ample time tonight with his presentation and Q&A to, uh, to just benefit from his time and experience. Uh, for more than 30 years, Coach Bergenoff has been involved with the sport of rowing, with 20 of these years serving as a rowing coach. He started rowing in the United Kingdom at the age of 13. He won two national championships in the pair at the age of 16, and among other successes, earned a place on the Great Britain Junior National Team competing in the pair in the 1992 Junior World Rowing Championships. After graduating from high school, he attended Boston University in his freshman year, there, he placed fifth at the National Championship Regatta. He was a member of the Varsity 8 in 95, 96, and 1997 seasons, and was awarded the team Most Valuable Player his sophomore and senior years, graduating with a Bachelor of Science in Human Movement Studies. His coaching began after graduating from college, when he taught and served as a rowing coach at the Gunnery School in Connecticut. Following his tenure as a coach in New England, he moved to Tulsa with his wife in the summer of 2002, and became the head coach of the Tulsa Rowing Club Juniors, now the Tulsa Youth Rowing Association, serving as head coach over the next 14 years. He built their program from 10 athletes, no equipment and one coach, to 65 athletes, $200,000 worth of equipment and six coaches. 
Many of the athletes that he has had the privilege of working with have continued on to compete at the collegiate level. In the summer of 2013, he led a successful effort to take the first junior crew from Oklahoma to compete in the Thames Cup at the prestigious Henley Royal Regatta in the UK. He, him, he also himself has competed as a master's rower, winning many titles along the way. He currently teaches high school chemistry, AP chemistry, and IOS game design at Holland Hall School in Tulsa, Oklahoma. Additionally, additionally he loves to program and develop two IOS rowing apps, um, Erg Dude and Rowing STEM. I'm just going to admit somebody here. There we go. Um, which are currently available on the App Store. Since retiring uh, from head coach responsibilities in 2016, he started a private remote coaching practice serving athletes in various parts of the world. He currently serves as the director of G Grow, G Row, Tulsa, a program at the Tulsa Youth Rowing Association. This program features a rowing STEM component and aims to provide rowing opportunities for the underserved youth of Tulsa. Um, he's put links, I, excuse me, I put links to everything referenced in this intro into the chat for easy access for everyone there. So you'll see all that information there with links. Please join me in welcoming Coach Neil Bergenroth for a discussion on understanding force curves to improve. Welcome again, Neil, and thank you again for being with us tonight. Well, thank you for the introduction and thank you for the opportunity to come and present uh, this presentation for a second time. Um, I presented this to uh, a master's camp uh, in early September, right when school was kicking off. And um, the fact I get a chance to, you know, talk about it again, um, I continue to learn, I continue to, you know, read and, and research and, and understand new ways of describing this. So I really appreciate the chance to come and share what I've learned and uh, that journey. So, um, I need to, there we go. This is, uh, this is me in the five seat right here. I'm rowing at Henley War Regatta. This is me. Uh, one of my last high school races in the, in the Princess Elizabeth Cup, and this was 1993. Um, and so, you know, to say that I've been blessed in my rowing journey is really a bit of an understatement that I've had the chance to compete at some of the top races uh, in the, in the uh, you know, in the rowing world. I also, as you mentioned, uh, rode uh, in the pair uh, in 1992 uh, in the Montreal um, World, World Junior Championships. It was kind of a, a goal of mine. Um, I, I made that as a junior because uh, I was too old as a senior to, to compete. And so this is me rowing with uh, uh, my pair's partner, Ali Shmi. Uh, we ended up ninth, uh, which um, I'm, I'm very proud of and just it was for me just trying to get to this this place at 17 years old and um, and 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 have that opportunity was was really a, a big milestone for me uh, since since graduating high school I rode uh, for Boston University as you mentioned and uh, this is us roaming at Easton Sprints uh, that's me in the stroke seat right there and I know the question that you're all wondering is, uh, why did I decide to wear a Boston Celtics hat for the Eastern Sprints? And I, I don't have an answer for that. I'm sorry, um, but uh, I just kind of looked at that picture. And why am I looking out of the boat? Probably is the bigger question than the Boston Celtics hat. But I'll leave that for further discussion later on. This 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 picture above is actually a a, a painting done, and we somebody found that from my team in in an art gallery in Connecticut. And it happened to be us, although the artist has not chosen the Boston Celtics colors for obvious reasons. I probably would have ruined the picture. Um, so this is this is me uh, rowing uh, in college, um, and um, you know, like you mentioned, uh, I am a chemistry teacher. That is that is really my full time gig. Uh, I've been teaching ever since I graduated college. Um, I'm director of outreach at Tulsa Youth Rowing Association. Um, I retired from head coaching in 2016. I uh, actually had some uh, heart trouble. I have AFib. Uh, and so um, kind of had to bring the stress level down a little bit. Uh, and so, you know, but I needed an outlet. So what I did was I started a blog um, 
coachbrogenloft.com and just started to put down some thoughts and some ideas about um, my experience in the sport. And specifically, my goal was to try and reach those coaches in the first one to three years of their coaching journey um, and just sort of, you know, share my love of the sport. And then um, I started to, uh, I've, I've, I've always been a web programmer pretty much since the end of, you know, since I graduated from college and then got into mobile app development about three or four years ago. Uh, and so you're going to kind of see all three of those things in this presentation. Um, and as we, as we progress to give you a little bit of const, uh, content on, um, you know, when you see those, see what, what I'm doing uh, generally in my career and how that's, uh, how that's kind of weaving into, uh, you know, my coaching uh, and things like that. But before I go any further, um, one, of the, one of the real gifts from this presentation, when Chris Chase called me in August and said, you have four weeks to do a presentation on force curve, and my initial reaction was, okay, that's, uh, that's, a, that's an interesting and um, sometimes uh, difficult discussion because everybody has their own ideas about what makes a boat go fast. So I reached out and contacted Peter Mallory who is a rowing historian and the author of um, uh, The Sport of Rowing. And Peter is uh, a very generous man. And he has spent time talking to me and explaining uh, a lot of the findings that he uh, found in The Sport of Rowing. If you're not familiar with The Sport of Rowing, it is basically um, four volumes, 2,500 pages, of about 200 years of rowing history. And uh, Peter has spent a lot of time collecting force curve graphics um, along uh, with Cass Reckers, who is, the, uh, who is the inventor of the Row Perfect. And so uh, really a lot of uh, what I'm about to explain is kind of driven by a lot of that research, a lot of, that, a lot of those findings. Um, he's, it's basically his life's work. And so when I say I stand on the shoulders of the giant, giants, that is not an understatement. Um, that is, that is uh, a really a debt of gratitude to Peter for, for spending time with me, investing in me, and um, bringing me along as a coach. So I would be remiss if I didn't mention that at this point. So the graphics that you're going to see are given to me by him uh, and, uh, and also cast records. Uh, and and some 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 of these are conjectural force curves um, for the purposes of education. So thank you, Peter, uh, and I appreciate your friendship, which has been really a, a huge gift in this process. So um, this is an interactive presentation, at least at the beginning, and I, I'm kind of interested to see where everybody is located. So what you can do is you can go to this. Uh, web address right here. Either type it into your phone or uh, get another browser window and uh, type that in. And you should be able to see this graphic shown on your phone or your iPad or your, your computer. And you should be able to interact with um, the, the graphic by clicking on it and uh, just if, if you would like to just kind of show us where you're located so we have a good sense of you know, where everybody is from this evening. And I have a couple more slides uh, like this uh, that you can interact with. Um, just just kind of general, just wanted to make the, uh, I wanted to make this a little bit more interactive than just a, um, you know, a, a one person talking for an hour, an hour and a bit. Um, and so uh, hopefully uh, that's working. What I'm going to do this evening is I'm going to talk about the history of the force curves, uh, when the force curve was first recorded. And then I'm going to talk about um, the various different types of force application strategies that you can employ. Oh, we got our first one. All right, welcome. Looks like Florida. Um, and um, then I'm going to talk about sort of the continuum of the different types of strategies. And I'm actually going to use uh, actual uh, international level rowers uh, to uh, illustrate uh, some of the application strategies 
and then I'm going to talk a little bit about how to um, how to go about rowing uh, this the force curve uh, in a way that is successful. And then towards the end of the presentation, I'm going to talk a little bit about uh, my journey developing the rowing STEM curriculum that we're using in schools uh, here. Um, and uh, some of the other apps that I've been developing, uh, you know, motivated by um, COVID and just kind of as an online coach myself, trying to solve the problem of, well, how do you see data from a rower that's, you know, 5,000 miles away in real time on a concept too. So um, I'm, I'm very pleased I have the opportunity to uh, talk to you a little bit about that this evening. So we're still getting a few more. Oh, great. We've got a few more people. That's great. So it looks like we've got, um, you know, some on the West Coast, some on the East Coast, and, and I'm in the middle. I guess I don't know if I can click on this, but that will probably take me to the next slide. I guess it's not going to let me tell you where I'm from, but I'm right in the middle. Tell us Oklahoma. So um, the other thing that I want to figure out is who am I speaking with this evening? So the next question is how much do you know about force curves? And um, they range from what is a force curve? I know very little about a force curve to I know a little about force curves. Um, I actually know quite enough enough to be dangerous or I am Yoda when it comes to the force curves. Yes, I love Star Wars, so I kind of had to put that in there. Um, so, um, we, you know, we're getting, see, it's, it sort of changes. It's pretty awesome. Um, but I think it looks like um, we've got, you know, 83% of people here um, who are just kind of starting out learning about force curves. And then, you know, we may have one or two people who, who know quite a bit about force curves. Um, and, and nobody's gone to Jedi master level yet. So hopefully we can get a few of you to Jedi master level by the end of this uh, discussion. So um, the next question is, where do you put the most emphasis in your drive phase? And so when you, when you, you think about applying force during your stroke, do you, do you emphasize the leg drive? Uh, do, you, do you work towards the finish? Uh, you kind of a little bit of both, so you would put that in the middle. Um, and so where do, where do you put most of the emphasis in your, in your drive phase is the next question. It seems like most people uh, here are, um, you know, what we would call sort of legs emphasis in the drive phase. And, you know, that, that, that doesn't surprise me that much at all. Okay, it's pretty, pretty normal uh, to have that. So I think you know, talking about force application strategies um, can be um, almost a religious discussion uh, in a way. It can get very uh, heated in terms of what, what, how should you coach and this, that, and the other. And I think just for this evening, if we could adopt a open-minded attitude to some of the things that I'm gonna present this evening, uh, particularly with the historical context and the work that Peter has done, um, you know, there may be one or two things that might be worth experimenting with uh, as you continue in your rowing journeys. So now I have a better sense of who I'm talking with this evening. First of all, a word of warning. It's not really a word of warning, but it's, it's, it's the, the false curves that I'm going to present here. Um, we're, we're not comparing the magnitude. Okay, so when I, when I you know, put Mahi Drysdale's false curve next to you know, Langer's uh, force curve, next to Peter Haining's force curve. You know, kind of, it kind of looks like one's bigger than the other. What, what, what Peter has done is normalize these uh, you know, by a nine by 11 grid. And so the comparison is not magnitude. Um, a lot of the conversation is gonna be about the shape of that curve at more than, you know, well, is Drysdale's peak force higher than Langer's peak force and so forth. So just a little word of warning when you look at some of these graphics, um, we're looking mainly or, or really purely at the shape of the curve and how you apply force from the entry to the release and, um, and, how, that, uh, and how that would effectively draw that force curve. So a little bit of historical context, the first significant force curve experiment 
uh, was actually done at Cornell in the fall of 1900 or early 1901. Um, a coach by the name of Charles Courtney, who was uh, the Cornell coach, obviously, at the time, was kind of getting frustrated by getting beaten by Penn. Uh, Penn had won the IRA uh, for three years. And um, you know, naturally, Cornell weren't very happy about that. So uh, what Coach Courtney did was he enlisted the help of an engineering graduate student called, who was actually an alumnus of the rowing team. So he was a rower himself. Uh, called Tom Hall, and they connected a rowing machine to a force sensor for the first time. Now, I don't actually have that force curve. It's not, a, it's not on the historical record, but uh, Peter has uh, produced a conjectural curve that what he thinks was most likely seen by Courtney and Hall the first time they connected a rowing machine to a force sensor. And as you can see here, uh, the, the curve uh, kind of starts steep and then it, then it becomes concave and then it becomes convex again. It definitely has this sort of two-part uh, effect to it. We call that a two-part pull-through. Now, the reason for that was that the style that Cornell were rowing was the back opening up first. That was the thinking that was gonna create the most amount of uh, velocity and acceleration in the shell. And then, uh, and then the leg drive opened up. And it became apparent to Coach Courtney that there was a discontinuity in that force curve. So essentially a force curve is what's the force, you know, either on the gate, uh, whatever you're measuring or on the handle over the duration of the stroke. And I'm gonna get into a slide a little bit in a couple of slides that kind of explains that a little bit more. But this was the first time that um, in history that this kind of uh, scientific approach um, was, uh, was used. Uh, and, and in this case, it kind of changed the way that Cornell rode afterwards because they realized that maybe the way they were rowing wasn't the most effective uh, in terms of accelerating that shell and, and, and keeping force on the pin uh, as, as, you, as the stroke proceeded. So another bit of historical context, uh, the, you know, row perfect. Uh, I think most people are familiar with the row perfect, kind of simulates the transfer of mass. Um, and um, Cass Records was the inventor. And in 1995, he created this machine uh, for his daughter, uh, Marjolaine. And in 1995, she was rowing this kind of a force curve. Again, we're gonna get into what these look like in just a second. And um, the, the, the story goes that um, a Dutch lightweight row by, by the name of Franz Goebel was uh, actually got on the machine, you know, and, and, and records at this point thought, you know, this was, a, this was an engineering experiment and, and, and uh, Goebel said, can I have one? And, and so at that point, the row perfect was born and we all know, you know, where the row perfect is at this point, we're in the third iteration of that. Um, but what's interesting is that um, his daughter's force curve changed during this eight-year period, and these were, uh, and these were, uh, of course, taken by uh, uh, her father. So, what is a force curve? Well, primarily, it's as I described it. It it it's a curve that over you know it can it can take a couple of different formats, which I'll discuss here. But essentially on the y-axis is the force on the handle. And on the x-axis, we can either have the distance, which in this case would be the length of the stroke or the time uh, of that stroke. So it, it just kind of depends on, you know, what, what, what you're looking at. Uh, I know the concept too, it really has time because each data point is, you know, 0.015 uh, of a second. So you can see they take a number of points um, generally. If you're on a row perfect, then the x-axis is time. And the beginning of the curve is uh, the start of the drive. And the end of the drive is at the end of this curve. And so what we're able to see here is, you know, what is the force uh, on the pen or on the handle 
uh, over the distance of the stroke or the time of the stroke. The peak force is the point at which the force is maximized. And what we're trying to do here, and this is, this is, this is my point of view on this, is that we're trying to maximize the momentum imparted to the shell or the flywheel at the release, which is something that can resonate with an athlete. And so we're very much concerned about, you know, really getting run out of the boat rather than what the legs might be doing early on. And so this gives us a window into how it should feel. It's, you can't feel a force curve. You know, you don't look at it and, and we can get into a discussion of sort of being absorbed by the data and losing the feel. So what I'm gonna do in this presentation is talk a little bit about the science, but also bring the art and, and bring them together so that we can see, you know, how do we create uh, the most amount of speed? So the area under the curve is essentially, if we were to, you know, do some calculus or, you know, we were to, 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 to do trope trapezoids and, and break it up into little bit, little pieces, we would be able to calculate the, the area under the curve. And as I'm sure you can see, the area under the curve, the, the more we can get more area under the curve, the more work we're doing. So if, if distance is on the x-axis, then the work is force times distance, all right? That's what we're measuring underneath that uh, curve. If time is on the x-axis, then we're measuring impulse, which is force times time. So uh, essentially, one might think that uh, the goal here is uh, to get, you know, uh, to get uh, as much area under the curve as possible. And yes, to a point, yes, that is that is it. But part of my discussion this evening is the shape of the curve is more of a distribution of force during that stroke. And how do we distribute that force? And where do we put our emphasis in order to create uh, the most boat run for yourself personally. So can we all agree? What are we, what are we aiming for? What are we looking for in rowing? Well, essentially it's very, it's very simple. We're looking for boat speed and that's what we're aiming for. So I think that should be uh, the focal point of this evening's discussion. We're looking for creating as much boat speed as possible. So, like I said before, it's a window into the effort of force during that drive phase. That's what we're looking at. So at the heart of the discussion are the force application strategies. And these terms that you see at the top, Kernschlag and Schrupschlag, are terms uh, that were, that were uh, provided by the German Democratic Republic scientists in the 60s who were studying force curves uh, as it pertained to uh, the, the German athletes. And so what do the terms mean? Well, a Kernschlag stroke is a solid stroke with a hard beginning. That's sort of roughly translated uh, in, into, you know, what does that term mean? A Schlupschlag stroke is a thrust stroke, okay? So the emphasis is a little bit different than a Kernschlag stroke. A Kernschlag force curve looks very similar to this one. It's an immediate explosive leg drive where the goal is to create as much force as possible as early on in the stroke. So it is a very front-loaded force application. And so the thinking is, let's get to the peak force as early as possible and try and hold on for the rest of that drive with whatever energy that we have left. So this is, this is very much an explosion off the front end. Uh, it's, it's, a, it's a very sharp application of force and is one approach to uh, moving a boat. The other is Schubschlag, which is a much more uh, continuous application of force. You'll see that this curve is a little bit more organic uh, or rather much more organic than the other curve. 
And the idea behind a Schubslag stroke is a progressive application of force, surging force application from entry to release. But again, it's, this is more of a one cut type of idea rather than you know, this progressive application of force. And don't get me wrong, this is not a soft catch stroke. This is definitely not a soft catch stroke, but the way in which you apply pressure uh, to the boat uh, or to the machine uh, is a much more progressive approach. And I think you can see from the two different um, ends of the continuum here that the one on the left is, is a little bit more triangular in, a, in, in, its, in its look. And this one is, dare I say it, uh, a parabola. And I understand there's mathematical terms here or a haystack, a much more symmetrical application of force. And essentially what, we, what we're looking for here is a continuous force uh, on that pin. We're looking for being able to keep that force uh, on that pin as much as possible. And so essentially, what we're aiming to do, if, if we're keeping a pro continuous application of force, is keep that curve as convex as possible, okay? Every time, every time it becomes concave, like over here, we consider that a force discontinuity. We've considered that uh, a loss in connection. And so what happens is when we lose connection, uh, you know, with with the acceleration, and we're, we're losing uh, we're losing that application of force. The curve can become concave, and then what happens is we start to recover from that, and so now it becomes convex again. So essentially, anytime you see a force curve buckle in on itself, there is what we consider a discontinuity in uh, force application. So right now, what I'm going to show you is a few examples from history of uh, people who were successful uh, with, with both uh, a Kernschlag and a Schlupschlag approach to force application. So uh, by no means does it mean that um, uh, necessarily that, you know, you have to do Kernschlag to win or you have to do Schlupschlag to win. It doesn't necessarily guarantee success. It doesn't necessarily preclude success as well. So he was a uh, lightweight rower at 1989, 1990. Remember I mentioned him uh, with the origins of the row perfect and he rode a Kernschlag approach. So what we're gonna do is you know, recognize that was the curve that I used on the last slide. And what I've done here is taken the pictures out of the sport of rowing in Peter's work. And I've done my best to interpolate where the actual style is or where the actual body parts are at different points. So what are the legs doing? What, are the, what is the back doing uh, as best as possible? Okay, but I, I don't want to represent this as being absolutely scientifically accurate, but I think it still does give you a good idea of uh, what's going on. So at the beginning of the stroke, uh, we've got uh, the, the entry. And if you watch the first few uh, frames here, uh, it's, it's the legs are pushing that boat along. And you'll notice here that the back is pretty much immobilized against, uh, against, the, against the legs. So at this point, there has been no body swing. It's all legs. And what you get is a very steep application of force. This idea being let's get to the peak force as fast as possible. And so as the stroke progresses, what happens is the, the back is then going to open up. But the issue with this is because so much force has been put in, the back can't, you know, keep up that force so we get a discontinuity and in Goebbels stroke that means that when the back opens up there's a little bit of a concavity in here but as he progresses with his stroke and, and notice at this point the arms start to pick up so we get that acceleration back again and then at the end of the stroke there's a slight hint of a ferryman's finish where he's beginning to move his upper body 
uh, and using the oar handle to move himself back onto the recovery, which is a strategy uh, that some rowers employ. And you see what happens here is we've lost so the connection, so it very much flattens out there. So that's that's a, a classic Kern flag approach. Uh, he was successful with it, uh, won two gold medals, um, actually spent actually three weeks on the row perfect before, I believe it was 90, um, because he couldn't get out in a boat and he still went on to win a, um, a single a, a, a gold medal uh, at the world championship. So, you know, that's, if that's not a ringing endorsement for a row perfect, I, I don't know what is. And no, they're not paying me any money. So the next uh, is Peter Haining, who again was a kind of a, a baton uh, here, uh, exchanging the baton with Goebel to, you know, given a year or two. And he was the men's lightweight single world champion. And what's interesting about his force curve is actually the peak becomes much later uh, during the stroke. So let's take a look at frame by frame uh, of his uh, particular stroke. So, uh, you know, Peter Haining uh, sort of rows what we would call more of a modern orthodox type of rowing, uh, where it's, a, it's, 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 and again, going back to Goebel, it's a very sequential stroke. It's legs, then back, and then arms, right, in, in a way. And I understand there's some phasing, but it's very much the legs go down, the back opens up, and then the arms finish. And, and it, is, it, is, it is quite likely, and it is possible to row like that and have a Schrupsag approach. Uh, but typically, when you row that sort of segmented um, uh, way, you, you end up with one of those uh, Kernschlag uh, force curves. So Peter is, again, he starts the drive and his back is immobilized. And then what happens is he starts to open up his back and actually he reaches the peak after the midpoint of the stroke. So when, when the oars are perpendicular uh, to the side of the boat, uh, he, he, uh, he ends up uh, reaching peak force. So this is, you know, as you can see, a much different application. Now, that's kind of strange, uh, and, it, and it might be more to do with the genetics uh, of uh, Peter Haining. For example, his arms were about 15 inches longer than his height, right? So his span of his arms, so that might have been why he does it. When, you, when, 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 when discussing with him um, uh, why that is, he just kind of found like he felt like he got the most boat speed out of of doing the stroke that way. Um, and then what we get is a, is a very uh, almost flat and a straight line here between that peak um, with not much convexivity in it towards the end of that stroke. But again, he was successful with this. This worked for him and he won three world championships with this style of stroke. But, you know, hopefully maybe these graphics are somewhat helpful in, in terms of you know, interpolating where these uh, athletes and the, how they're rowing. But what's interesting is his style is very, very similar in some ways to Goebel, but this aspect of force application might be hidden unless there was a way that we're able to measure it. And I think that's an interesting point because many rowing textbooks will give you pictures of, well, here's the style uh, and, and here's what we should do with the legs and the back and the arms. Um, but there hasn't been a huge amount of literature uh, in, these, in, these, in these textbooks typically about, well, how do you apply force? I think, I think that's an interesting thing. And it's certainly something that um, as I started to prepare this presentation, now I watch footage of rowing and I'm looking at it through a couple of lenses. I'm looking at it in terms of what is the athlete doing with their body but I'm also looking at it in terms of, well, how are they applying force and doing my best in my mind's eye, inaccurate as it is, to figure out, well, how are they moving the boat? How is the shell moving? Um, you know, what's happening at the face of the blade uh, in terms of that force application? So I think once you kind of get a, get a sense of these force curves, then you begin to look at rowers uh, in, a, in, in, in less well, in a style way, I guess, but also probably more importantly, how is that force being imparted to that shell? 
Um, and I and I I wanted to create. I think um, Jessica, you're going to send the slides out to people at some point. Um, I wanted to create a resource. So there's some YouTube links uh, to the 1993 race. He actually loses his oar at the 1500 meter point, and and goes into second place or third place, and then rows through um, the the rest of the the rest those two in, in front of him. By the end of the race, he wins. It's very exciting. So I thought I'd include that link there, but I'm not going to show that this evening, uh, just just because of time. Uh, Sarah Winkless uh, was a Olympic bronze medal, and this is good, another good example of a, a very smooth Kernschlag uh, curve. That's just one of the smoothest ones uh, I think I, I've seen in the book. Uh, again, it's left leaning, uh, but it it doesn't have what we see uh, so much of in Goebel's stroke where he loses that there's a discontinuity and it's a lot more organic looking uh, in, its, uh, in its profile. And so when we look at the way that she, she moves and she applies force, again, it's a modern orthodox approach where initially the legs go down and the back doesn't swing open but then it does start to swing open as the legs are continuing to press down. And then, you know, we get kind of more of an overlapping sequence of legs, back and arms, and we get this kind of an approach. So, you know, again, it is possible to row a smooth uh, Kernschlag uh, force application. Um, and it also, you know, is, is interesting uh, to see uh, you know, what her force curve looks like. So what I'm doing is, is I am shifting around the continuum a little bit. On the next couple of slides, uh, Thomas Langer, who, who is about as close to perfect as possible. And we're not looking for perfection here because, you know, perfection isn't what we're, game, we're aiming for. We're looking to get as, as best as we can. And again, we don't want to fall into the the trap of trying to just stare at that curve and get the perfect, get it to get it to work. I call that sort of hacking the force curve and missing the point of, of feel and, and, and patience in that stroke. Thomas Langer, and this is a Schubslag application, rose a very near uh, perfect parabola here, more of a haystack approach. Uh, he was very successful, well championed three times, Olympic tra uh, champion twice. So again, another approach uh, to force application when we see him at the entry, uh, that's where he is. And then he's pushing his legs down, but you can see that the way that he is moving his body is a lot more concurrent than the other examples that I've shown you. So what's happening here is he's using his legs and he's levering his back against his legs uh, at this point. So what's happening is we're getting a concurrent contraction and he is, he is, he is doing a very good job of using uh, all his, his arms and his back and his legs in a concurrent fashion. And the result of that style is this very symmetrical uh, Schubschlag approach. Uh, and uh, at the end of it, uh, there again is that ferryman's finish where we get a little bit of a tail off there and that's a that's an important uh decision you know in in rowing there's decisions to make uh for example um if you watch you know during the later years uh Pinson and Redgrave uh you know they are uh, all about drawing that stroke all the way through because for them you know, finishing that stroke off and then spending the energy coming out of the bow uh, is a good trade-off for them. That works well for them. In this, in this approach, we've got Langa, who is, is, is at, at the end of that stroke, using the, using the oars to kind of move his head forward and almost start that, start that recovery. Um, uh, and so that's the trade-off. He loses a little bit here at the end, but he gets to the next stroke a little bit earlier. And so, again, it's a trade-off. It's checks and balances. You make this decision, you get these pros, but then you get these, these drawbacks. And then I think, I think you know, it's, 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 you've got to look at things contextually when you're coaching an athlete. You need to decide, you know, where are their strengths? Uh, what's going to work for this athlete? 
And again, this was a decision that he made and it seemed to pay off pretty well for him because five goals, you know, you can't really argue with that. And then um, again, another race highlight if you, if you wish to check that out later on. Uh, Joan Lynn Van Bloem is another uh, approach. And now we're shifting uh, again back to that peak being later on. Uh, this is a stroke slide stroke. And we're going to look at her application. And, you know, we should get just pretty, pretty good connection at the beginning. And then you see the back. See, the legs are just starting to go down. And that back is, back is already opening up. Again, this idea of concurrency of, uh, of movement uh, rather than a, uh, you know, a sequenced approach uh, to, the, to the stroke. And... Uh, you know, we see here our back is opening up. Uh, she's really uh, basically, you know, she's catching, uh, she's catching accurately, but there's this, this, this Schubslag approach is this idea of keeping force, uh, you know, constant all the way through the stroke, as opposed to the Kernschlag, which is this initial, this initial peak. And then we'll see what happens towards the end of the stroke. This is a much more one cut type of approach uh, to, uh, to the stroke. So just keeping that acceleration going. And as we progress here with the pictures, uh, we've got um, you know, her, her back and her arms working through. It seems like you know, her back swing finishes and then her arms at the end. But as you can see with these types of strokes, what's happening is um, the back and the arms are working a lot more concurrently towards the end of that stroke. Um, and that's uh, a hallmark of, um, you know, that concurrent uh, use of legs, back and arms. And then finally, uh, Purdy Karpinen, who was Olympic champion in the single for uh, three years there, uh, very successful. And it's sort of the other extreme here. So we've gone from Goebel, which is this left-leaning curve, to Karpinen. Now, now Peter did mention that um, the way that this was recorded may not have been the most accurate, uh, and, and, I'm, and I'm paraphrasing there. But I think it's still an interesting uh, case study to look at, um, you know, how Karpinen was successful rowing this um, rowing this pickup. You notice here that there's a discontinuity in, in his leg drive. We get this concavity and then he picks up here and it looks reasonably organic here. Uh, but the emphasis is, is much more, you know, as we're working through that stroke and peaking a little bit later and trying to keep that curve as convex as possible and really row that last third of that stroke as effectively as possible. Uh, Again, trying to maximize the speed of the shell uh, towards that end of that stroke. And so, um, you know, we've got his back and his arms working together and it's pretty close to finishing the back uh, with the arms there. So what we've, what we've looked at here, and I hope those graphics were, were helpful in terms of being able to look at what what the emphasis is and, and how things, how, how the body is moving to generate those curves and the different strategies. Like I said, there is, there is some examples of Kernschlag being a successful strategy. There's examples of Subside being a successful strategy. So what we've got here is a continuum, right? And this is, you know, a source of great debate in the coaching, in the coaching world as to, well, what's the most effective one? Um, but when we look at this, and I put all of these uh, curves together, you know, in this continuum between, you know, this explosive beginning uh, or this thrust stroke, and I put all of these graphs, you know, kind of in a row here, uh, one might argue that these two maybe could be flipped. Um, but uh, as you can see, as, as we go from left to right, you can see how the curve starts to shift to the right uh, this being Langer's curve right here. And the, the takeaway point here is that uh, the, the, the uh, Kernschlag 
uh, are in the vast minority of the fastest crews in the world, sort of far less uh, in, in, uh, in Peter's estimation uh, with his work, uh, far less than you know, 15 to 10% at the high level. And that's interesting uh, because, um, you know, typically it's sort of, uh, you know, uh, I think it was Kleshnev who said in 2001 that 85% of rowers row this sort of sequential curve. And so you would think that uh, is, if, if that holds true at the international level, that 85% of those athletes uh, will, are going to be rowing this current flag sequenced approach. And we find that, that is that is not the case when you look at uh, the history, uh, you know, over those, all of those data sets. Yes, you can cherry pick data points uh, like Mahi Drysdale, for example, uh, who has this current slag approach. But when we look at, when we look at the body of evidence, uh, particularly if you look at the 12 scholars in the 2004 uh, singles final, uh, there were 10 of them that were rowing the Schubschlag uh, forced application, and two of them were rowing Kernschlag. So a, another great example, particularly an American example, is uh, the 1984 double of Brad Lewis and Paul Enquist. And there's not a ton in this presentation about uh, matching up force curves, but I thought this was an in interesting historical footnote on you know having the availability of both of these um, uh, force curves, and that was Brad Lewis's force curve. Uh, again, it's sort of this uh, it's 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 quite organic towards the towards the back half of the stroke, and this was Paul Enquist, which is a little bit more. It's still left leaning a little bit. Um, but it is, it is uh, a bit more organic in approach, but I think both, obviously they won the gold medal, so it was successful. And it also means that we, do we have to match them up exactly to reach success? Well, no. Uh, is it an idea we're searching for? Well, most probably yes. Um, and so what I did on the next slide was um, uh, I put them both together just to give you a sense of uh, how that double might have been as fast as it was in 1984. And as you see at the end of that, that, that last part of that stroke, which is going to be um, part of the discussion about, well, how, how do you go about rowing uh, that uh, parabola? Um, an interesting point is, you know, how are you rowing that last third of that stroke? Uh, and so you can see from this that it, it was, this is, this is Lewis right here. And this is Enquist right here. So they probably, you know, worked pretty well uh, in that double over that second half of that stroke. And again, they're doing some good things over here. I don't miss, I don't, I'm not, I'm not saying that we should discount the catch here. I want to be very clear about that. This is a hard catch, uh, but there's a bit more patience on it uh, than this explosive Kernschlag approach. So, the question you're all wondering is, now that we know this, how do I row an effective force curve? And so, well, that, that is the question, right? How, how do I row an effective force curve? So our first clue here, and I'm gonna do my best with this because it's a YouTube video, is to watch animals. When we're thinking about how do we move, I think animals are a great example of biomechanics and, and cheetah is the fastest running animal. So I'm gonna play this video here. It's not just a really cool video about a cheetah. It also has Samuel L. Jackson commenting on it as well, but I'm gonna turn him down here. Um, and you can see that link. So let me see if I can get this to go. This is live TV here, so give me a sec. Let's turn the playback speed to 0.5 and play that. And I'm gonna turn Samuel L. Jackson off. Here I'm going to go to. We're going to go here. All right, so we're about ready to go here. So this is this is our first right here. Goes the antelope, and I'll let this video progress. I think we all know what's coming. Here we go.
And in fact, both animals are a great example. But look at this. It's pretty incredible watching that cheetah run. Long stroke. Right. <laughs> but here's the thing. Nobody taught that cheetah how to run. Like wow. there wasn't a coach saying, okay, now you do this with the legs. And so the focus here is how, how is that, how is that animal moving? And it just instinctively knows how to create the, the right amount of velocity. So I think that's our first clue. And you can, the course curve. <laughs> what's that? Yeah. It's, I don't think anybody's hooked a cheater up to a force curve. So I don't, I don't know. So smooth. Oh my be, That could be interesting to do. Whatever. Eat, eat the machine. Holy cow. That's great, isn't it? Yeah. I mean, it's amazing. Okay. So the next clue is let's watch a fish swim. First in full motion, for normal speed, and then in, and then in slow motion. Yeah, blink and you miss it. Mm. Let's, let's look at the tail. Let's watch the tail and the little whip of the tail at the end of that motion. Huh. Wait for it. Yeah, see the tail? Yeah. The whip at the tail moves the fish along. So those are, those are a couple of clues here. The next clue is gonna come from a, uh, a very successful coach, uh, a New Zealand coach called Harry Mon. Uh, Harry Mon uh, was a phenomenal coach. I think he spent a lot of time coaching New Zealand. Uh, he, was, he worked for uh, Cambridge University at some point. Uh, and I think one of the last coaches um, uh, before he sadly passed away uh, because of cancer, I think it was around 2001, um, was the Great Britain eight that won gold at the Olympics. So let's hear what Harry has to say about where should the focus be when we're trying to row well. Mm, beautiful. <clears throat> Ten people and eight of those. Oh, I'm try that again. Sorry, live TV folks. I had my sound off. Let's try it again. The crew 90, 94 crew, not sitting where they were sitting, but it was actually one of the best crews that, um, that was in New Zealand, went from New Zealand, and um, didn't, didn't do well at the, at the, at the last, finished fourth of the Olympics, uh, which was a uh, really disappointing for everybody because it, it certainly was the, the best and probably the, and the fastest crew that's probably come out of the country. But however, here's some of the idea of this of this this rhythm, of this feeling of the of the boat glide, and we can sense that from the the, the people, the, where their concentration is. Um, you know, it's, it's sort of it's sort of in a, in a outside of the boat in a way. Um, they're just sort of floating within a within a rhythm that happens to be there, um, which they've obviously created for themselves. But you know, getting this pattern. This has to come out of the picture that, that you've got yourself. This one. Entries. There are certain people in this, in this crew that you can just, you sense what's going through their, through their mind or how, the, how the, you know, the boat feeling is being taken through, through their, through, and being experienced and ex uh, expressed through their face. Okay, that's fine. Um, okay, so, I mean, the concentration isn't on where their heads are in the right place or their bodies or whatever. I mean, surely we better work through these phases to get people where they want, where we want them to be, where they should be. But basically, it was just finding a nice, easy flowing movement um, that also made for, for uh, I mean, a crew that was fast. And um, it's from and it was, it's from this. From, this is the method, I think, that was one of the best ways that you could actually you know, you just get a crew to row very, very comfortably and, and relaxed. And um, I think the rest of the others is pretty similar. Mm -hmm. Feel great, obviously. It's so, uh, 1990. Yeah. Pretty cool, huh? Yeah. 
like a run. A nice, relaxed. But and I think what you're seeing is that, you know, very, as I said before, some variations on the same thing of people doing the same sort of thing, same sort of, of you know, the same sort of concentration. Uh, it's not an intense concentration, but it's, an, it's, a, it's a concentration on on a boat movement, on feeling of, of the boat speed, of the timing of the boat. And it's all, to, you know, to do with, sort of a self-expression, if you like, of a, of a group of people in, a, in, a, in a, an environment, in this case, it's the, this, this rowing boat. But, um, you know, I don't think it was, there's very much difference between the way people are working here and the way people are working in the, uh, the one you saw from 10 or eight years before that. Yeah. So, and, 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 and Harry Mons, uh, ideal force curve uh, again this was a quote from him energy expended of the catch is not available at the end of the stroke hmm. and so uh this was he had a template for that uh, great britain eight and he would coach and coach and coach until he got that parabola and hmm. then he would be quiet hmm. and i think and i think there's an interesting anecdote uh there's a book uh, called Will It Make the Boat Go Faster by Ben Hunt Davis. Uh, and, and he was the two seat of that Great Britain eight. This is actually Greg Sell, who was coached by Harry Mon. And, you know, and I think, you know, Peter made a comment and said, Greg would tell you that if you ask Greg how he rode, he'd say legs back arms. Uh, but, you know, how, how you row, how you think you row versus, you know, or what you've been taught uh, is it, it can be uh, difficult for you to really realize how you're moving yourself and how you're creating that force. So mm, they are not, it's about the tree. It is not the leaves. What does it mean? This was Ange Angelo Severino who said that. The leaves are, this is what the legs do. This is what the back does. This is what the arms do. But my message this evening is one of let's look at the organic whole which is what harry mann is talking about when he's saying you know presumably we have to teach somebody we got to do this and we got to do this and we got to do this but ultimately we want to get athletes to the point where they are flowing organically and moving in an elastic in an elastic manner so that's what uh, Angelo Severino means where it's, it's not about the tree, it, it's, it's about the tree, so it's about the whole movement rather than, you know, individual parts. So what I'm going to do now is essentially bring the science of rowing, which is biomechanics, the physics, the data, the force curve, together with the art of rowing, how does it feel? And the art of rowing, timing, application, flow, those kinds of things, and when we meet those together, we get boat speed. And so, you know, how do how do we how do we do that? How does that how does that achieve? So, last weekend uh, we went to the gathering place, which uh, you may have heard is one of the uh, one of a park that opened up, cost us seventy million dollars to make in Tulsa. And my daughter and I uh, were, well, she's on her phone, which, you know, that's what she get, you know, 11 year old, I suppose. Um, and I'm pushing her. And I think this is a really good way to demonstrate, uh, you know, how I think about uh, taking the entry and, 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 and mm -hmm. going with that Schlupfstag approach. So I'm gonna play this video and, and, um, I'm not waiting <laughs> Mm -hmm. Push. So what, what I'm doing there is at the top of her swing, I'm respecting the inertia of the swing. I am not trying to, you know, explode into the back of that, uh, back of that swing. I mean, if I did that, she would, she would stop jumping in the swing. So what I'm doing is at the beginning of this force curve, and, 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 and this is something that, that is, this is patience, right? We're dealing with water, right? We're dealing with a flywheel that has decelerated over the course of the recovery. And so what we're doing here is that first inch is, again, I'm not saying a soft catch. So just to be very clear, 
This is a shot catch. We need to be, we need to be connected. But we're spending that fraction really just moving. Yes, we're pulling, but we're not trying to give everything, right? And then as we progress, we accelerate to 100%. And we want to do so in a smooth fashion. And I think this, the swing shows an example, and it's an abstract example. I know it's not a rowing stroke, but it's an example of how to work with the momentum. When the, when the boat is slower, we have to respect that. When the, wheel, when the wheel is slow, if we try and explode off the front end, some of that force is gonna come back at us and it's gonna become ineffective. And so the approach here is to start at 50% just for that first inch and then accelerate to 100%. And this is something that Gladstone teaches his crews and he gets a lot of resistance initially because I think uh, the common thing is we need to explode and hit that catch. And there's this, there's this tendency to resist that. But this is, this is what I'm demonstrating on this swing. It's just when you put that blade in, uh, you you can't beat the water to death. You can't if you try and do that. You're you you're going to run out of energy very quickly. So we're we're being very patient at the front end, just 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 for a fraction, as we as we start. So you watch those Yale crews. And I've got a video in a minute to show you this. They load the blade up, and then you know in true Fairburn esque, they they send the puddles. They work the blade and send the puddles away. And they're using concurrent contraction of their body to do that. So as I as the as the swing builds momentum, I've got that little flick. Right? You could do the same thing with a bicycle wheel. Turn the bicycle wheel and flick the wheel, right? We've got to, we've got to meet the wheel at its speed. If we're meeting the wheel too slowly then it slows down. But if we meet it just right, and then we're able to accelerate and a little flick of the wrist and the wheel, the wheel gets that, gets that momentum. It parts and that sort of that flick of the wrist is that sort of end of the stroke analogy that I'm making. So how do we row this curve? Well, I think the approach is to feel that organic hole. Again, it is the tree, it is not the leaves. Ultimately, if you start to look at your force curve and think, okay, I've got a little concavity in my leg drive, I'll just focus on that, or I'm not rowing the last third of that stroke very well, so I'll focus on that. What happens is you emphasize one part of the stroke and therefore you end up de-emphasizing another part of the stroke. So the approach that I take when I get on the machine is I think about what well, I just think about it in terms of a goal rather than a process. I think about it in terms of, well, how do I get this boat to move as fast as possible up the end of the stroke? And how do I get myself into those rhythms that you saw with, with Harry Mann's cruise? And so this patient pickup, and then we accelerate. And we've got to row hard. This isn't, this isn't a lecture about, well, this is how you move fast and don't really pull very hard. That is not my message this evening. We've got to be patient and then we've got to accelerate and we've got to use the legs and the arms and the back. I think sometimes rowing is taught with legs, back, arms. And, and, and sometimes rowers think, okay, so I contract the legs and then I contract the back and I contract, contract the arms. What I'm, my point of view on this is we want to engage everything so that whole chain, we're hanging the weight between the, 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 the handle and the seat, and we're engaging the whole frame. Now, you can do that in a sequential way. You can do that in a concurrent way. But if we activate everything and we activate the arms, what, what, what happens is we're able to row this far more organic looking curve. So the analogy here on this curve is it's like a semester long class in college. So for example, how do you make an A in a or an A plus in a semester long uh, course? So essentially that patients feel that, that the art, how does it feel, is the beginning of this. And going to class and doing well in the first midterm is the beginning. You, you got to do go to class. You got to take notes. You got to you got to do well on the midterm in order to make the A, and then as we progress, we've got to continue going to class and do well on that second midterm. But 
if we are going to make the A in the course, we got to do well in the final. And so this Schubschlag approach over the last third of the drive, which is the trickiest to row in terms of skill, because now the boat has accelerated in order to keep force in a continuous in a, in, in a continuous fashion. Now the boat's traveling faster, so naturally it becomes harder and harder as we accelerate the boat and the boat picks up velocity to continue that acceleration. And that is why rowing that last third of the course, the last third of the stroke is, uh, is, is just like that final. Being able to row that well and, and work you know, consistent acceleration through and, and work that force and keep it continuous and preserve the organic integrity. And that is, and that is your final exam. So again, force times distance is work. Force times time is impulse or change your momentum. And rowing that well, that last part requires the most power. It requires, it's a short amount of time. And in order to continue to add value to that stroke, we gotta, we gotta, we gotta be able to do something here with the arms. And that's why uh, this concurrent uh, approach allows us to sort of work towards that end of that stroke. So how do, you, how do you engage your body? Like I, I've said, the way to do that is to concurrently contract your legs, your back and your arms and work them together. And watch the blade, right? Watch the athlete, but watch the blade. See that they're applying the force correctly. And when they do that, then go crazy in the coaching launch because you can, you can emphasize, they can't see the force curve in the boat, but they can feel that boat accelerating uh, as it as we go, as we finish that stroke, so here's a here's a point in history: Yale versus Washington, Henley, 2015. I want you to watch what Yale are doing, and I particularly want you to watch what the stroke seat of the Yale boat is doing. And again, this is this is this this sort of Fairburn S stroke where we're we're connecting, we're patient. Yale are very patient about picking that picking the water up and then they send that puddle as hard as they can. And if you watch the stroke seat, you'll see a great example of a concurrent uh, approach to the stroke. Uh, that gentleman can row in 1906, 6K. So clearly what he's doing is helping create force. Again, it's a lot tougher to teach somebody to row like that. So again, decisions need to be made, but I think this is a great example of the different force applications. Bearing in mind here that Washington were national championship cha champions this year, and this wow. is happening a month after that. Oops. It starts you like this. And you can hear the starter over there with your an East Coast Go. supporter watching this in the States, supporting Yale yeah. University, or perhaps on the West Coast, supporting the Huskies of Attention. the University of Washington. Welcome Go. to the start of the ladies' challenge. Right. Yeah, and expect to see the Yale boys going out really hard. I saw them have big, big boys, six foot six, six foot eight, trying to get off the start hard and fast and aggressively as they can on the left of the screen. Take a look here at the Washington crew, and there's no shots of power there either. Absolutely, mate. Good man. You saw him in the stroke seat of the Washington crew. He can pull uh, 1903 for the 6K ergo. And those of you that know the concept to ergo, that's putting down 135s for nearly 20 minutes. That's a stroke man. He's on the, he's just coming to pitch. He's on the left of your shot now, facing the coxswain of the University of Washington crew, Stu Sim from Australia. But it is this Yale crew who've got away really, really fast. They're just such strong boys. And you see the power there coming in through the shoulders, coming in through the arms. And I think they're going to get out as hard as fast they can. Because as much as they can here, it's what the crew is setting up to any kind of rhythm coming out past the quarter mile. So it's University of Washington closest to us. If you are a Husky supporter, then don't worry because you will know that your crew that's uh, won every race apart from the match against uh, Cal Berkeley, which they lost, but they won the national championships and they came through to win in that. They've got a fantastic mid-course pace. But if you're over there watching in Connecticut, well, you've got to be smiling all, all over your face. The Steve Gladstone coach crew, the old man in his 70s, has finally got a program 
these tremendous and for them to have this lead at an early stage in the race break. Yeah, we expect this to be a real dragster race, if you like. Really try and power out as fast as you can. It's the two-lane racing, it's the head-to-head, -head. it's not the six lanes, it's not what we might see in the international competition, the IRAs, where the Washington crew were the winners. This is where the Yale crew beat Harvard very convincingly. This is the sort of thing they're up for and they know what to do to power away early and try and gain control of the race. So there's the Washington crew, there's that uh, man in the stroke seat that we spoke about. So, so and again, that video goes on for six minutes or so. I think we can see that there's this the Washington team seem to be a lot more harried at the catch. They're still working hard. Again, they are opening the back. But Yale just seemed to be having this idea of just putting the blade in, being, and then again, the patience in the faster boat becomes less and less because it's moving faster, but it's still there. And that they are they are sending those puddles and and it's a classy example of a shrub flag uh, approach. And I think, you know, now we've got. Yale winning national championships. And again, it, it took Gladstone a while to build that momentum, uh, but they, they are winning races. And, uh, you know, Gladstone is a, is a Fairbairn coach through and through. Uh, and again, a very successful one at that. And seems to be wherever he goes, he's successful. Cal, Brown, now Yale. Uh, so there's definitely some, some, uh, some, some magic there that, uh, and it's not really magic, that's what, that's what he's doing uh, to teach these, uh, you know, gentlemen how to row and, uh, and they're being very successful. So what I've done here is compile a few other examples of Sinkovich uh, brothers, oh. uh, example. Um, and um, Jessica, how are we doing for time? I realize I wanna respect people's time uh, and I've been going an hour and 20 minutes, so. We're good. Um, I can check in with everybody to see how folks are doing. Is everybody good with it? You can unmute to say. Yeah, with Sinkovich coming up. Yep, absolutely. We did so. have, I, I don't know if you want me to follow up on a couple comments, and um, but um, I can wait till the end if, if folks want to actually just ask your questions and make your comments directly. I think maybe that would be better. Um, well, let me let me just finish up again. I don't, I want to be respectful of people's time. Appreciate everybody, uh, you know, listening. Uh, I'm gonna I'm gonna I'm I'm, I'm assuming you're gonna email this presentation out to people. So uh, I wanted to just create some resources here that people yeah. could look at different examples. Uh, so that's really more the purpose of this this slide uh, and just just looking at those things. Um, uh, Jack Kelly, senior. Right. 1920 Olympic singles champion, 1920, won the, the singles and the doubles. Look at the, that, that early arm break, uh, and he's opening up the back, Olaf Tuft, rowing the same way. Uh, again, it's tougher to do that. Uh, again, decisions need to be made as to, you know, what your rowers are and whether they're capable of that. Um, but here are two examples of, of subslag uh, power and, and, and 80 years apart. Uh, and, uh, you know, the physics of that uh, have not changed. So to, to conclude, I want to show you a couple of applications that I have developed uh, in the last year. Um, I am an online private coach, uh, so I have various clients, uh, in, mostly in the U.S., uh, and I got really frustrated with not being able to see the metrics on a PM5 monitor from however many miles away. So I went to work uh, to develop an application that would allow me to see the force curve and all the metrics that the PM5 monitor uh, produced. Uh, and so I just, here's a video of this. This is a, uh, a gentleman that I work, that I work with uh, and um, he's rowing and uh, I'll just play the video and you can see uh, this is an iPad running over here, and then this is a web browser with uh, Zoom or Skype running over here. So there's no tricky editing here. That is, that is the speed at which, so he's finishing that stroke, and I'm getting his force curve points, as well as all of his splits and his rate and uh, those kinds of things in real time. 
So I've been working on this probably since about February. It, 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 it will be out when it's ready. Um, currently my teaching bandwidth is taking up most of that development time. Um, but I, I wanted to develop something that would allow me uh, another, uh, a better view uh, and more feedback uh, for my clients and to help them understand uh, how, to, how to create speed as much as possible. Um, well, gonna, this is uh, another video of, this is what the app looks like. So this is what- Hi guys, latest video on the YouTube channel, just a quick- I'll, I'll shut myself up there. Um, uh, this is the app right here. So this is running on iPad or an iPhone. And then this is what you see in the web browser. Again, that's, that's real time stuff. Um, and so, uh, it also works with the concept to logbooks. So you can upload your, your data, uh, from within the app. So, um, the other thing that it will do is, uh, it will, at the end of your uh, rowing, it will, uh, allow you to view every single stroke and every single force curve uh, that you recorded and all the other metrics in there. So those that love data, <laughs> you can skip to any stroke that you want. Um, so that those that love data and force curves can, um, can see all of that. So that's, that's something that's coming. I'm still working on it, working with my clients on it. Hopefully I'll get there uh, over the break at some point. Um, but I wanted to share that with you as something that's out coming soon. Um, other videos that I put out on my YouTube channel, uh, force application strategies. So I'm actually using the app and rowing on the erg and there I am with the bike demonstrating uh, the, that acceleration of the wheel. So I'm just leaving that there as a, as a resource for you to look at later on if you wish. Um, so one of the things I'm also involved in is outreach. Uh, and we're, we're really working hard to get rowing machines into uh, public schools. And uh, what we've got here is our STEM curriculum. Uh, I have another app called Rowing STEM uh, that again does the force curve. It is free. Uh, and it contains all of the labs and activities that I've written uh, for the rowing machine. And um, I'll show you the, that app. So these, these were the first two kids that showed up. It was, my, it was my birthday a couple of years ago and I wasn't sure who was gonna show up and those kids showed up. And so, and this is a view of the app. Again, there's that force curve. So I have this fascination with the force curve. I really wanted to build an app that could provide access to it. All the data is recorded and you can export that. So my thinking is that students can record their own data and then take it to math and science class or the activities that I've provided. And here are the different activities, you know, accuracy versus precision. So just trying to weave in science with uh, the machine and, and use it as a, as a learning tool as much as a fitness tool. I think there's a huge opportunity for that. So this app's called Rowing STEM and is completely free and it will always be free. Uh, I will work on it when I get a moment, um, but it is there for you to have a go with, particularly if you wanna get your force curve points uh, and, and use an app that, that, will, that will do that. Um, and so that's another example so I actually just ported it to Android uh, this last summer. It's kind of wanted to get it on both platforms for, for maximum distribution. And then um, the latest one I've got, this is for the young kids, ErgMath, it's kind of this robot. And uh, you sync it up with the PM5. You can choose what operations you want the kids to solve. So this is kind of aimed at a younger audience. You sync it, you sync it up with the PM5 and um, what you do is you click on the answer to the problem. And then once you've clicked on the answer to the problem, you have to row to the answer. So now the robot, now I'm rowing on the machine and, and the robot's kind of happy. So it's just kind of a way to teach kids math, simple math, but also get them moving. So it's like the Xbox, but you actually burn more calories. So I thought that was, that was so again, this is, this is something that is, um, that I'm working on more of a proof of concept right now, but something I'm excited to bring out uh, at some point. 
And almost my final slide. Um, this is this is my this is my test to see if the last hour and a half was helpful to you or not. So, if you'd like to respond, maybe I maybe I helped. And I hope nobody goes with A, but you can write A if I didn't if I didn't explain very well um, everything. But uh, it just gives me a sense of you know did I did I did I aim at uh, at least educating and, and exposing you to different things and different ideas? We got some Yodas now. We didn't have any Yodas before. So now we have some Yodas. So I will take that as a win uh, this evening. And um, again, appreciate your attention. Your homework assignment is to experiment and go have fun. A concept 2 PM is enough. Although the RP3 is there and there's another machine called the BioRower. There may be more out there that I'm not aware of, but um, I do appreciate your attention and I will do my best to answer your questions or your comments. Thank you. Cool. Well, how about we, um, if you want to unshare screen and we'll just uh, okay. open it up for everybody. And if you want, everybody wants to just take yourself off, um, off mute. And there were a, 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 a couple questions that came up in comments. So if you, I, I, it looks like Richard Hall, you had a question and, and Volker, you had a comment. And so if you guys wanna take it away. Uh, sure, I, my question was uh, when you said that 10% um, <coughs> of crews, um, only 10% of crews being successful at the national level with a front loaded force curve, uh, is that just for singles? Um, and how much do the, uh, does the ideal force curve change uh, by class of boat in your, in your, uh, from your perspective? Yeah, it's a good question. Um, it, it's, it's, you know, it's a stat that Peter writes about in the sport of rowing. I mean, he's the one that's looked at all this stuff. Um, uh, in terms of the force curve changing, I would think that it makes sense that the force curve leans more to the left in a, in a faster boat. Uh, I think that makes sense. Um, in terms of uh, his his uh, work, uh, he has looked at all of this footage. He's looked at all of the data points and uh, done an analysis and come to that number. And uh, I think that strengthens his argument that you know if eighty five percent of people are rowing sequential, then why aren't eighty five percent of people at the at the international level doing that? So. First of all, uh, I would like to congratulate. It's a really nice presentation that you have there, Neil. Um, Thank you. I specifically I liked lot. your your approach as a coach, right? By mm -hmm. uh, trying to connect the feeling uh, and, and try to create a feel uh, that we need for rowing, right? That, that's correct. I am a little bit concerned about uh, these force curves there um, that you used from, and I, I, are these all force curves that you used from Malloy or are there some from uh, uh, um, PM3 too? Yeah, I mean, some of them are cast re records. Uh, some of them are stuff that uh, Peter has captured. Uh, so, I mean, he's, he oh, went so around. He, he took this. Yes. He took this from film. Right, he took this on film because well, he, in those days, there was, yeah. I mean, I mean, when, the, you, when you go back curves. to the, the 30s and the 40s, there's not much out there because there's not much out there. Um, but he's, no, no, he's what I want to say, Neil, what I want to say, with Neil, he sure. took this from film, right? And he was probably uh, calculating the, the speed of the hand. And the footage that he's used is very, sometimes very sketchy. So you actually, there's not a force curve that you show. You show the speed of the handle, more or less, right? I would. This is how I would see it. Well, I believe he, I believe he yeah. captured the force curves on the row perfect in the concept too. Well, like he I, used Berg monitor to from all these people. I, I don't. I don't. Peter uh, 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 Lange would not row for you on a, a row perfect. Uh, knowing him, oh no, and uh, he, no, he's East German guys. They were very, very careful what they would do, and I, 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 I think I read some of Peter's stuff, and I, my thing to remember it was the speed of the hand, and you have to be a little bit careful with this. 
And the second thing is also, you have to also do not forget, uh, you not only have to produce a force curve, you also have to watch where is the, at which part of the stroke is the force most efficient, right? And of course, the force is more efficient towards the catch, right? And therefore, um, all the um, approaches nowadays go more towards the catch, right? Yeah. Not to say, and this is again what, what you said, you have to look at the whole stroke. Right. right. You want to get on very quickly, not hammering. Again, I agree with you, right? But uh, you have to do it. If you lose speed at it, uh, the catch, you're not getting it ever back, right? And then the last thing there is the, all these force curves that you brought there are now 30 years ago. And in the meantime, we are rowing 10, 20 seconds faster. So Volker, would the force curve change depending upon the ideal force curve? ideal uh with all the caveats uh that's going to depend a lot upon then how you rig the boat um in well, terms rigging of rigging is one thing but definitely also the speed of the boat yeah right i mean in, in uh, you you would row probably differently in uh, long distance training than you would race in a tailwind mm -hmm. right and in a headwind you race a little bit different too i mean is this all correct what neil said you want to yeah. build a lot of impulse or work that's for sure right but you also can should not forget the efficiency of the first part of the stroke hmm. and the the, the 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 trick is not to overdo it in the beginning i mean all right. what neil said right that's that's right. the trick right you want to be quick but you don't want to be hard neil yeah. is this correct yes yeah, I'm not, I'm not, again, I was very careful to not make that sound like it's a soft catch because it's not, <laughs> it's not at all. But there's this, I mean, there's also this, this feel that you develop over years to get that right. And I think that's what you're saying, Volker, is that correct? Yeah. Oh, yeah, 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 I agree. But then also, um, you mentioned Kleshnev. Uh, Kleshnev is actually someone who measures uh, uh, all the force curves. Right, he has really force curves, and he clearly found that in in, in race situation, high the, the faster people are, the, the the higher qualified they are, the more the curve moves towards the yeah, left. Yeah, it does. I mean, that's that that is true because the higher you go, I mean, you watch you watch rowers at steady state do this somewhat symmetrical those that row that. And then you say, okay, go at 34, 36, and then it becomes legs, 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 right? And so the, the curve, it's pretty normal for most people to shift it to the left. I agree completely. I have a quick question just as a coach teaching beginning rowers, novice rowers. Do you have a special, mm -hmm. do you have a technique where you're transitioning them from the sequential, you know, steps into more of the concurrent rowing stroke? Can you ask the question again? I'm sorry, Siri decided to go off. <laughs> so I'm curious, in terms of teaching novices, yeah, you typically you teach them the sequence of the stroke. And I'm I do, curious, I, I do, it, I, in all honesty. And then I'm curious just how, how you, is it sort of just an organic process in which they're learning that it's, you know, the, about the concurrency of the overlapping bits of the stroke and sort of just getting to that just organically, you know, from how they feel it, or are you teaching something specific in that transition? Um, well, it, it's, it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a long, it's probably a very long answer, but it, in the, a short answer is when I personally look at an athlete, I go, okay, what can I tell them that they can do to create the most speed possible? Mm -hmm. Right. And I think, like I said earlier, there's trade-offs, right? The, you can argue concurrency, you can argue sequentiality. Sequentiality is easy, easier to teach. Mm -hmm. right? It's easier to get a novice to, you know, and I, I would be very hesitant to teach opening the back right off the catch with a novice if I wanted to do that, because typically what happens is the rower just, just mm -hmm. they don't get their weight on the handle. Mm -hmm. So I think you've got it always, and this is why we get paid the big bucks as coaches, right? Is <laughs> is right? Is is we have to make decisions about okay, how do we get? You know, we've got a certain amount of time, and where is this rower at? And 
and what and what decisions do we have to make? And I wouldn't typically teach a rower to open up. I would be more interested in making sure that they were hanging their weight on the handle <laughs> before I was worried about um, you know too much force application. Now you get a rower to do that. Maybe you're at the three or the six month point, and you're happy the way it's going. Then then you start to introduce those concepts at a time when you the gut tells you, okay, now now we want to do this. Mm -hmm. I, I do think though, an important part of the conversation on a team is how do we think about applying force? I've spent, and I admit, and I'm, I've still got a long way to go as a coach, and, and but 10, 15 years ago, I don't know that I was talking about force application. I think I was thinking about do this and do this and do this. Mm -hmm. And now when I coach, I tend to weave that in more just because, again, of this journey that I've been on in terms of reading this stuff. And I certainly appreciate Volker's comments and I'd love to collaborate with you and learn a bit more um, and, and just kind of get see where we're at. Um, but I think that's the short answer to the question without getting into the, into the weeds on mm -hmm. you do this and you do that. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Yeah. Anyone else um, comments or, or any question, more questions for Neil? Okay. Um, we're just getting comments in here from, well, just thank you. <laughs> Thanks, Neil. Thank Thanks, you. Jessica. Very interesting. And uh, yeah, anyway. I think unless there's anything else, we'll wrap it up here. As I said, I did in the chat put... Um, all of uh, Neil's information um, so you can get a hold of him there and also my email in case you'd like to uh, you know let me know let you know about if you want me to let you know about future chats that are coming up and um, as well as sending out if I haven't already uh, the PDF of uh, presentation tonight so yeah cool all right well Neil I think we'll wrap it up there then and yeah Really appreciate your time and, and um, you. presentation. I and, and just being able to actually pass this on to high school and college level students as well. My, me personally, being able to do that, I think it's really great. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Great. Cool. Thank you, guys. Thank appreciate you, Neil. It.